I request Professor Dr. Renu Lutra, Vice Chancellor, Bilbotia University, to please come up on stage and give away or present the bouquet to his mom and dad. Disruption, and we believe anyone of you 
could be the catalyst to innovation and disruption. Our speaker today is one such example of disruption who started coding at the age of five, built an iOS app at the age of nine, and the world's youngest IBM Watson programmer at 12. I'm sure if, from, if you're from tech background, you must have gone through some of our books like Let Us See. Lately, Tanmay has been working with IBM for the AI initiative. She's a TEDx speaker, keynote speaker for many prominent and prestigious bodies. So without any further delay, let the learning begin. Thank you so much. This is not about the place of humans. This is about what's, what taking what humans are good at, which is of course learning, and taking what computers are good at, they're taking mathematical skill, combining that in order to create such a powerful combination that can, as I said, change so many people's lives. Yes. So I want you guys to agree with that. That would work with Shadow Nobel. Be the Shadow Nobel. Introduction with immense pleasure. I welcome Tanya Bakshi. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Perfect. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining in today. My name is Tanya Bakshi, uh, and as you know, my passion is to explore machine learning technology. I'm really passionate about machine learning technology because it enables us as humans to take what computers have traditionally been good at, which is working with mathematical operations, and take what we as humans are so good at, working with unstructured data, and combine them to get the best of both worlds so we can understand unstructured data at scale through machines. But before I get deeper into machine learning and what I'm doing with it today, I'd like to start off by saying a huge thank you to the entire team at BPD for actually setting up the event and actually allowing me to be here today. Uh, and also a huge thank you to the staff and students here at Mogotia University and the College of Engineering here for actually putting, to, putting this together and joining me today uh, and allowing me to be here. This is really exciting. Now, as I mentioned, I'm here because I'm really passionate about machine learning technology. In fact, as we speak, machine learning is impacting hundreds of fields and hundreds of thousands of lives across the globe. You've probably all used machine learning technology today, maybe even without realizing it. If it was something as simple as maybe looking at your wrist and saying, hey Siri, what's the weather going to be like today? You use machine learning to instance, and Apple Watch actually goes ahead and gives you the weather. <laughs> From there, you're using the weather company to predict the forecast, and Siri is using machine learning to understand what exactly you're talking about to give you weather exactly how you need it. When you're writing an email or a text message on a phone, nowadays you're using machine learning to help you write that email in a more efficient manner. Or even if you're doing something like watching a movie on Netflix, Netflix is trying to understand the kinds of movies and TV shows that you like, and from there it's going to recommend new TV shows that it believes you will like. Out of all the different fields that machine learning technology is impacting, there's one field that I'm most passionate about, and that is the field of healthcare, which is why I'm working on numerous different projects in this field. This, including a project that enables me to actually diagnose depression early in the youth by actually tracking a bunch of the different data points that generate every single day on their mobile devices and figuring out small patterns that could hint towards depression in the future. I'm also working towards a project that enables me to use machine learning to provide an artificial communication ability to those who cannot communicate naturally by understanding their electrons and those and brainwaves. I'm also working on a project that enables audiologists to diagnose hearing disorders in much faster and much more accurate ways than they ever could have done before without the power of new machine learning technology. And I'm also working on a project that enables clinical researchers to diagnose and actually predict adverse events that people may experience to drugs in a much more efficient way and even before they actually take the drug. And this also includes even if that specific patient and that specific chemical composition of drug had never been tested before in a clinical trial. So machine learning and the possibilities with it are endless. But before I get even deeper into what I've been doing with machine learning technology today, I'd like to start off at the very beginning. More specifically, with how I got into computing and technology in the first place. 
But to do that, though, we have to travel back in time quite a bit. Back to when I was five years old. This is nine years ago. You see, when I was five years old, of course, as a curious five-year-old, I was trying to absorb as much information as I can. And what really intrigued me, though, were computers. The reason was because, well, to a five-year-old, watching the computer do anything, display my name on the screen, that two numbers, even change colors, was like magic. I wanted to figure out how it worked. And my dad saw that curiosity that I had, and was actually able to introduce me really simple programming languages. In fact, my very first few applications were written in simple languages, like FoxPro and Batch. But my curiosity only kept growing. And so, I started to use numerous different learning resources, like different books, I used to use the internet as a learning resource, in fact, quite a few different books that, from EPV that I used to use as learning resources, uh, to learn more about programming, because that's what I was really they really in. Uh, in fact, when I was seven years old, I had not even started about people programming, was that in grade three, I had a test coming up, not in the prologue, two that I was and I can't send out. So I needed to practice rule based systems, but what I was really good at was creating really simple Windows apps to be visual basic. So what I had to buy is a really simple Windows app. I'm sorry, that's not the case. But these are not questions. And it worked. It actually helped me out with the problem. And I got to do this course of tech. But I'll get to that. And so years later, I thought, why would I have access to what we had to do at all? And it's more than that I used to my web systems. And I was not here. Sorry, I had my first on a web application. Now, in rule based settings, I have a classic kind of AI that I've been working in the chess app of the technology. Chess app is old, it's 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 there would always be tens, if not hundreds, of people that would reach out to me instantly on uh, comments, on my email, on tweets, and they would ask me questions like, how can I get into programming? How can I start learning programming? How can I learn new, new technology like machine learning? How can I implement this algorithm in my application? Or how can I fix this error? And I started to notice that there is a lack of resources out there, especially for beginners. There is a very steep learning curve for people who are trying to get into technology for the very first time. And so I realized that, well, why not take whatever I learned about this technology, whether it be iOS app development or whatever else, and share it with more people for as many people as I can. Which is how I actually started my goal to reach out to at least 100,000 aspiring beginners to help them innovate along their journey on learning to code. I'm really glad to say that I'm already around 8,800 people there, and I'm always working towards this again through numerous different media. This includes my YouTube channel, the books that I write, the blogs that I write, but also the different talks and workshops that I conduct at schools, universities across the globe, and of course the keynotes that I have at lots of conferences as well across the globe, essentially taking whatever I learned about technology and making it accessible to more and more people. Because you see, machine learning, or technology in general, is powerful, but we need to have people who are actually at the back end programming, using, and implementing that technology in the areas where they feel fit if we want this technology to truly be useful. In fact, speaking of making technology useful, another thing that really told, drove, drove, drives me towards sharing whatever I learn about technology with more and more people is, well, the fact that it's going to be absolutely critical to know how to communicate with technology in the very near future. In fact, Mark Anderson says that in the future, there are only going to be two types of jobs. Those in which computers tell humans what to do, and those in which humans tell computers what to do. So if you want to be on the other end of the spectrum, and you want to be telling the computers what to do, it is absolutely necessary to know how to speak the computer's language, to know how to speak to the computer, so you can actually talk to it and program it with your own custom applications or implementations.
And so I've been working towards that goal ever since then. But even though I kept creating YouTube tutorials and I was writing my first book at the time, which is now published, even though I kept doing all of that, I still felt like technology was missing something. I still felt like technology just wasn't as fun as it used to be for me. And I realized that it was a very simple reason for this. And the reason was because I felt like technology was very rigid. Technology is very literal. You code something in, and it immediately starts becoming obsolete. It never adapts, it never changes to users or the data that they generate. It's just there. But one day, when I was 11 years old, by complete coincidence, I happened to stumble upon a documentary while I was uploading a YouTube video. A documentary on IBM Watson playing and winning the Jeopardy game show back in 2011 against the two best human competitors on the game show, Ken Jennings and Brad Lard. I'm sure you've heard of this, and just in case you are unable to grasp why this is such a huge feat for a computer, think about this. Understanding natural language is already hard enough for a computer, but Jeopardy clues take that to the next level, many levels above, in fact. Now, computers aren't just playing chess or Go or understanding trivia questions. They're understanding Jeopardy clues that have puns, riddles, wordplay, all of that. In fact, some Jeopardy experts can't understand average Jeopardy clues like the ones that are on screen right now. It takes them a few seconds to even comprehend what the clue is asking for and then go ahead and correlate it with their past experience to go ahead and find an answer back to Alex. But seven years ago, back in 2011, Watson could use machine learning technology to understand those Jeopardy clues and even correlate it with four terabytes of unstructured natural language information that Watson had on his drives in order to provide answers to those Jeopardy clues. In fact, for the clue I've just shown you on screen right now, Watson answered a real game against Kim and Brad, who is Dartonic, which is the correct answer, and the best part is that Watson did that in under three seconds. Watson did this in 2.6 seconds, to be precise. This technology immediately fascinated me. And so I went ahead, figured out that Watson had now been converted into a set of tools for developers to use in their applications. And so I created my very first tutorial on the IBM Watson Natural Language Classifier Service. Ever since then, I've been working with machine learning technology, including, of course, IBM Watson, numerous other APIs, and my own custom implementations of neural network technology as well. But before I get even deeper into what I'm doing with machine learning technology, I think it's first important to completely clear up exactly what I mean by machine learning in the first place. I know I've used the term machine learning, artificial intelligence, AI, lots of times, but while machine learning might sound or even look extremely complex, it might not be as complex as you think it is. Because when you boil away the excess, Machine learning is actually really, really simple. It's just a set of mathematical operations that you use to build a numeric model, which can then be used to transform new input data into predictions, essentially allowing you as a programmer to stop having to write out all your hard-coded conditions to understand data. Machine learning will understand that data completely automatically without needing to hard-code all of those conditions completely by yourself, which is great when you're understanding data like natural language, visual, or auditory forms. But wait, there's another term I've been using, artificial intelligence. So what's AI? What's the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning, the two terms I'm using? Well, I'm sure you've heard the term artificial intelligence a lot. You've heard the term AI a lot. But I'm really sorry to break it to you, but no matter how many times you've heard AI, it unfortunately is not a thing. AI doesn't exist. Artificial intelligence is all about taking the human mind, organic intelligence, and simulating it entirely within a machine, within a computer, or at least a subset of the algorithms that go behind our intelligence within a computer. But that is unfortunately completely impossible 
We can say the architecture of computers. AI simply cannot exist with what we currently use to compute. Rather, what does exist are two separate and distinct sets of algorithms, rule-based systems and machine learning systems. Now, these are two sets of algorithms that a lot of people like to classify as AI. But I'm sorry, that's not the case. These are not artificial intelligence algorithms. They're meant to work towards building AI algorithms. But I'll get to that in just a moment. Before that, I think it would be interesting to take a look at an example of these two kinds of systems in action. Starting off with rule-based systems. Now, rule-based systems are the classic kind of AI that you find, for example, in the chess app on your computer. Now, chess nowadays is really simple for a computer. It can easily be even the greatest humans on Earth. And the thing is, though, many decades ago, this used to be an extremely challenging task for computers. There was almost no way for them to play chess. They simply could not reach human performance. But when IBM created Deep Blue, that all changed. Because Deep Blue allowed this computer that I had created to beat the world champion at the game of chess, Gary Kasparov, at least at the time. Now, how did Deep Blue work? Why was it called artificial intelligence? Well, you have to understand that Deep Blue was not intelligent in any way whatsoever. Deep Blue did not learn how to play chess. Deep Blue did not understand how to play chess. It was just a simple part of the algorithm provided by the programmers of Deep Blue. The way it worked is actually pretty simple. All right, take a look at the current chess board. For the board, what are all the moves you can make? Then, for every one of those moves, what are all the moves that the computer could, that the opponent can make? Then, for all of those moves, what are the moves that I can make? And we'll do that over and over and over again, sometimes using simple heuristics to choose which branches to go down. But we'll essentially take a look at tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, of possible uh, chess boards. Before, we'll say, hey, this board has the lowest likelihood of losing and the highest likelihood of winning, so I'm going to choose this branch, and it should theoretically, be the mathematically perfect way to go ahead in the game of chess. No strategy, no tactics, nothing. It's just a hard-coded set of rules that determines exactly how it's going to continue playing the game of chess. And because it can look ahead many, many, many more moves than any human possibly could, it's able to play much better than a human can. However, if you were to ask Gary Kasparov what it feels like to play against you, or any chess champion, what it feels like to play against a chess playing computer. They'd say that it feels kind of cold. It doesn't feel like there's another human on the other end. Because, well, there is no strategy that's applied. The moves might not make sense to you as a human that the computer makes, but they do to the computer. They make perfect sense, because mathematically, that's the perfect way to play. And so that is how computers play chess. It's not AI, it's a rule-based system. But that's also another example. This one actually uses machine learning technology, so it's much more interesting. And it is AlphaGo. I'm sure you've heard of it, the algorithm that can play and win Go against the world champion, Lisa Dahl. Now, how does AlphaGo work? Why is that a machine learning system? I mean, Go is just not a board game. Why not to apply the exact same technique to Go? And well, there's a little problem with that. And that is that chess, all right, you've got a lot of moves. In fact, you've got too many moves to calculate on a small computer. You'll need a big computer if you want to play against a chess grandmaster. But there's a small problem, and that is that if you wanted to calculate all the moves that you would need to play Go efficiently, you'd be dealing with more moves than there are atoms in the universe. In fact, even if you were to take every atom in the universe and make every atom its own universe, and actually combine all the atoms from all those universes, Go would still have 10 billion times more board space than there would be atoms in that huge sum. So it's impractical to play Go the way that Deep Blue played chess. But what is practical is to use machine learning, or specifically deep reinforcement learning, to understand how exactly you can play Go. And when the computer understands how to play Go, it can play just like a human. It will apply strategy. It will apply a little bit of foresight as to what it thinks the next player could move. In fact, when AlphaGo plays against a human, it plays almost just like a human would, using strategy.
strategies that humans themselves have tried and tested. But occasionally, AlphaGo will put in a move that makes no sense to any Go expert. In fact, most Go experts would say it's a dumb move. But a few moves later, turns out that was the turn that let AlphaGo win the game at the end. And so that is how AlphaGo really plays Go much better than any human could, and it's all powered by machine learning technology. Machine learning, again, is really not just one set of algorithms, it's a set of many, including deep learning, which is what I'm interested in, and what AlphaGo used. Deep learning allows AlphaGo to play just like another human by understanding the current board state in a way taking inspiration from our biological neural networks. Of course, though, there are many other techniques that go behind machine learning technology. Now, more specifically, AlphaGo uses a combination of two different techniques reinforcement learning, and deep learning. These two combined together allow the AlphaGo tool to learn in a very biologically inspired manner. And in under one week, it was able to train to be better than every human that has ever played Go. And so that is AlphaGo and why it's so important. But as I was mentioning before, these two sets of algorithms, rule-based systems and machine learning systems, are meant to work together to work towards building AI systems. But whether or not we'll actually be able to build AI is very questionable. In fact, I'd say that it's completely impossible to get to a state where we will actually have true artificial intelligence. Due to the very bare-bone way that our computers work, it's simply impossible for that to happen at the moment. And if we ever get there, it's not going to be artificial intelligence. It's going to be some weird biotechnology stuff that gets us to creating our own biologically inspired intelligence. That's outside of the realm of machine learning completely and entirely. And I'm sure you've also heard quotes like these. Like Stephen Hawking says, the development of full AI can still the end of the human race. And Elon Musk says, with artificial intelligence, we're summoning the demon. And I agree. In fact, I couldn't agree more. But the thing is, none of these quotes use the word machine learning. They're all using the word AI, artificial intelligence. And you have to realize that AI doesn't exist. AI is not a thing. AI is not meant to replace you. The entire thought that we can take a human mind and simulate it in a computer at the moment just does not make sense. Which is why AI is not meant to replace you. It's not meant to replace practically anyone, whether you're a healthcare practitioner, artist, or anyone else. It's not meant to replace you. Instead, machine learning technology is meant to augment you. Machine learning technology is meant to help you so that you can do more with the data that you're gathering every single day. In fact, to show you a quick example of how companies are using this machine learning technology to understand and make use of data that they're collecting quite literally 24-7, I'd like to give an example of the FBI. Now, the FBI, of course, they're great. They do a lot of great work. But they're powered by humans. They're human FBI agents. And none of them are powered by machine learning because, of course, that's not possible. Machine learning cannot take the place of an FBI agent. But there are some things that the FBI needs to do that are simply outside of the scope of any human agent. Like, for example, imagine having to track a certain neighborhood people, tracking where everyone moves, and in the end, doing analysis on where everyone has moved and how many people have moved in a certain area. Humans can't do that. That is simply entirely impractical. But what can do that is machine learning technology. More specifically, the machine learning developed by a company called Milestone Systems. Now, Milestone Systems is a Danish video surveillance video camera company. And they do a lot of great work. Not only do they develop cameras, 
They develop intelligent cameras that can actually track objects around in a live video feed and store that data locally in the camera. The FBI actually uses milestone system cameras and they actually put them in neighborhoods that they are very, very suspicious of. And towards the end, what happens is the camera draws a slightly uh, very, very low opacity lines of where everyone has moved. And what happens is, every time the line intersects with another, it creates a little bit of a darker patch. And in the ending video feed, you can see very clearly, in this extremely quiet neighborhood where very basically no one's walking, there's this one area where quite literally hundreds of people have walked. And that is quite obviously the area where someone is selling or hiding drugs. And the FBI is easily able to figure out who's doing what by using this milestone system's equipment as a 24-7 person tracker that no human can actually pull off. Sure, you can have 24-7 surveillance, but you do not have analysis on the data that was gathered from that 24-7 surveillance. And so that is just a quick example, in fact, more of a serious example of how we're using machine learning technology every day. But a little bit more of a fun example, in fact, one that I'm sure you're using in your everyday life without realizing it, that I'd love to give you. It's the example of product recommendation. Now, whether you realize it or not, if you upgraded to iOS 12 a few days ago, your phone is tracking everything you open on your phone, and it's automatically recommending, hey, do you want to open up mail, or do you want to open up mother, or do you want to open up this application, because this is usually the time or place when you open it up. Or who knows, maybe you were just stuck in traffic outside, uh, and I want to message your rep uh, that I'm going to be 10 minutes late. Siri will automatically figure out that, hey, I have this calendar invitation for this time, and it's at this location, this contact, but if I leave right now, it's going to take me 10 extra minutes to get there, and it's automatically going to figure that all out and say, do you want to message your that I'm going to be 10 minutes late? It'll automatically do all of that for you so you don't need to, and recommend it to you directly on the lock screen. Netflix actually goes really intricate with how they recommend things. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But before I get deeper into product recommendations, there's something I need to talk about. Something that might seem unrelated at first, but it's actually really, really related to what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, well, word to back. Word to back is an algorithm developed by Google. And the inspiration for it came from a quote. A quote from 1951 by John Ruger Firth. He says, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Essentially, you can understand what a word means based off of the words that come before and after it. Google took that quote very literally, and they developed an algorithm, as I mentioned, called word to back Essentially, what it does is it uses a neural network to predict target words based off of the context words, the words that surround that target word. And what they were able to do is they were actually able to create a neural network that generates these things called embeddings for all of the words in its dictionary. An embedding is essentially a mathematical, it's just a little vector, a string of numbers, and these numbers represent the semantics of the word. Not the syntactics, not how it's spelled, the semantics, what it actually means in a mathematical vector space. So what that means is you can quite literally do arithmetic with words. You can do things like king minus man plus woman is equal to, and then the pool you can the answer queen. Because it's able to remove the man in bang from the word king and add the woman in bang to that answer, to that result, in order to get the final vector that represents the semantics for king. This technology is really interesting, but it's not just limited to words. You can apply it anywhere. You can understand any arbitrary data based off the company that that data keeps, which is a really interesting part. And I apply this to music recommendations. Now, music recommendations is something that you probably use, whether it be Apple Music, Spotify, or anything else. You are going to use music recommendation to find new music. Because, well, it's very, very difficult for you as a human to go through huge libraries of music to just find the one that you are looking for. Machine learning makes that a lot easier. And I used a data set of around 300,000 users' listening preferences from last.fm. Now, what I did, though, is I didn't just train the neural networks on songs, no. 
Because what that would do is it would train the neural network to actually listen to the song and recommend acoustic with similar songs, which is exactly what I don't want to do. You see, in order to describe what I'm talking about, let's take the example of music recommendation for marketing. So let's just say I'm going to take a bunch of different advertisements from Apple, okay? And if I want to take the music that went behind those advertisements, what happens is I can easily tell that every single piece of music that I've collected is entirely different from the other. None of them have almost anything that's similar to the other ones. But there is one thing that all those pieces of music have in common, and that is that the Apple marketing team accepted that piece of music and said, yes, that can go behind uh, an Apple advertisement. That's the only one thing that they all have in common. Acoustically, they're all different. So, what I did is I fed in all of these songs into the neural network. And I told it to give me a song that would represent the perfect or the average song that Apple would accept into an advertisement, into a product review. And to give him an idea of how exactly the neural network processed these songs, I'm going to play a real quick clip of each one for you, just to give you an idea of how different they are. Then, once you have that, I'll show you what the neural network recommended and why it's such an intriguing, uh, it's such an intriguing response. Because of the fact that you're just detecting it early and giving a really, really simple treatment to avoid the growth of that specific tumor. And so that's why I'm working on numerous different projects that use the power of machine learning in healthcare. Out of all of them, though, there's one that I'd like to share with you today. It's a project of mine called Project Cognitive, and it's a collaboration between me and my mentor, Timothy Duncan. 
The entire point is to provide a kind of artificial communication ability to those who cannot communicate naturally. And the way I do this is by understanding their EEG. I'll talk about that in a moment. The, the inspiration to start this project came from helping out Boo. Boo is a quadriplegic girl that lives just in Toronto and suffers from Rett syndrome, meaning that she's unable to communicate or move in any way whatsoever. Only her mom can understand the very broad concepts that Boo tries to convey. And what I'm trying to do is use machine learning technology to understand the very broad concepts that we try to convey via her electroencephalogram brainwaves. So by collecting her EEG through custom headsets that we developed, I can use machine learning to figure out small patterns in her EEG, which would lead to me being able to give her an artificial communication ability for simple intent. <laughs> and with Boo's mom's help, I need to be live labeling the training data as it comes into the headset in order to train the machine learning systems that I develop. And the best part is that because it's powered by machine learning, it is very scalable and very flexible. It doesn't matter how someone lost their natural communication ability, could be to a certain disease or to, to a certain accident, as long as I can gather EEG data from them, accurate EEG, I can go ahead and feed that into the algorithm that I'm currently developing to understand it and provide them that kind of artificial communication ability. And so those were just a few of my projects in the fields of product recommendations, and now healthcare. Also a few examples as to how we're using machine learning through Netflix, through Amazon, how the FBI is using machine learning, and so much more. The possibilities of this tech are truly endless. But before I end my keynote though, there is one more point that I'd like to mention. And that is that finally, you need to understand that you shouldn't be afraid of that. You should not be afraid of machine learning technology. Because machine learning technology is here to augment us. Machine learning technology is here to amplify our skills, to let us do even more than we ever have done before by letting us make use of the vast amounts of data that we're all generating in our everyday lives. That thus far, we could never have understood simply because it's too complex or because the data is too vast or too broad. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining in today. That's what I have for my Thank you. Thank you very much again. If you'd like to contact me, you can do so on any of the following social media. I'd love to get in touch. But now I do believe we've got a QA and a session, so I'd love to answer any questions that you may have now as well. Thank you again. Very warm welcome, first of all, to Thank the you. College and University. Thank you. So my question is that you started, on, I should say, learn programming at a mere age of five, when most of the children are unaware of the fact that what they have to do, and like we are unaware of what we have to do in life. So what intrigued you to learn programming and make a career in it? Uh, that's exactly it, actually. It's the fact that I did not know, uh, in fact, I did not understand or, or even, um, I guess you could say, I did not perceive what the concept of a job even was at that, at that age. I did not know, ever really, that people were paid to code or paid to do anything for that matter. Uh, really, I just thought that the computer was just another toy, really, at that age. And so, what happened was, that when I began, it was just because you know, I've got nothing else to do right now. How about I work with the computer? Um, and because the computer itself would be really intriguing to me, much more than any other toy that I had, the computer was more interesting, intriguing because, I mean, at five years old, as you can imagine, I don't know what the computer is, I don't know what it can do. It even is like my name on the screen, so I'm magic at that point, right? So um, that intrigued me so much, and my dad saw that curiosity that I had, that he introduced me to the world of programming. Uh, and then I introduced courses like, uh, like, like you were certain books, the internet, you know, uh, you can use books to get, uh, to get some further into programming, um, and since then I've worked with technology. And I mean, since I started such a young age, it kind of grew on me more like a hobby, more like something that I just love to do, not really in something that I want to do. Like, like, like I, when I started programming, when I started programming, I never had in mind that this is something I'm going to do as a job. This is something that I'm doing right now for the fun of it. And so that's why I'm a programmer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hello, man. Hello. I just want to ask you, like uh, you said, you analyze those yes. mm -hmm. uh, I want to ask you, how did you, you know, break that audio clips into 
range of numbers. Did you quantize sure. the human uh, audible frequencies or what, what did you do? Sure. So this is the interesting part. I don't look at the audio clips. So the entire point of the application is to not look at the audio. Because when you look at the audio, the neural network is kind of biased as to what the audio actually sounds like. Whereas in this case, my sort of trajectory to the application was not to understand what the music sounds like, but to understand the kind of taste that a person should have for this music to be liked by them. And so essentially what I did is I took a bunch of users' listening history and I appended it all to one long string. And I created numerous different versions of the string in randomized order. And what this did is it created numerous different kind of like natural language sentences, you could say. And the same word to back algorithm that Google trained was applicable in this case. And what I was able to do is then say, all right, for this song, what's the nearest neighbor? And that is the song that is most similar in terms of taste for what what to like. Like for example, let's just say Apple likes two different songs, two different artists, two entirely different genres. But they like both those songs. So if there were another song that were not part of either of those genres, something else entirely, but Apple still likes that, how would I predict it? Not by understanding what the music sounds like, but by understanding exactly um, exactly what kind of song it is by taking a look at what other people like when they like that song. And so there was trained by users with same history. This was around 300,000 users uh, with, with around a million songs. Um, and the neural network was able to get a good idea and create a kind of vector space, 300 dimensional uh, vector space of music uh, and how exactly everything connects to everything. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Uh, oh, wait, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's a little more depth. The second question is how did you calculate the error? Because error has to be quantized, right? So, you need you need some value and yeah. you need the error. Right? So how did you you know calculate the error that which string is close to which string? Yeah. And so how, what is the degree of closeness or relatedness? Sure. Sure. Time? So basically, what I do is I take like this. So I take all songs someone's listening to. I take them all, create one unique word for each one, to create a kind of vocabulary <laughs> song. Then what I do is I create a, a list, a string of all those songs. Then I create like five different versions of that completely randomized because they all make sense in that order. Then what I do is I tell the neural network that I feed in one word, a target word, and I take the songs that two songs that come before, two songs that come after, and that is my expected output. Okay? Uh, and then what I do is I train the neural network on that, and in terms of a loss function, I just use the regular categorical cross entropy that's available for us. Then what I do is I go and train the neural network, and it doesn't really get anywhere, I'm not expecting high accuracy here, because the neural network is having a really hard time learning which song will come before and after in a randomized order. But what the neural network does learn is embeddings for all the music to predict those next pieces of music. Then what I do is I strip off the last layer of the neural network and just take that last embedding layer, and essentially for every song I feed in, I just log out the embeddings, and then I take, say, these nine songs, get their embeddings, get an average, and get the closest one, or in order to calculate distance, I just get the cosine similarity. This is pretty simple in terms of the embedding, but the neural network part in the words event is the real sort of uh, uh, magic behind the application. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. I have two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, do you think Sophia is an AI or just a machine learning? Yes. And the second one is, we were building a project uh, on the same healthcare issue. We had, uh, we were uh, building a symptoms checker, yes. but even with the error of 7% or 5%, the hospitals are like, this is a huge error because yes. uh, it may uh, make patient die. Exactly. So do you think uh, that those errors, those 5% or 7% errors can be eradicated or removed? Mm -hmm. Sure. So just in case, I mean, I'm sure who here is from part of Sophia, just so I know, have a good idea. Yeah, okay, so basically yeah, everyone's heard of Sophia. Um, just for the very, very few people that have, um, Sophia is basically a humanoid robot that's able to answer questions, and, and it's really, really realistic. Um, they, they actually, you, I actually met the creator of the Sophia Robot Dubai, uh, and the technology that goes by Sophia is wonderful. Um, they use deep learning, which is machine learning, in order to uh, synthesize hand gestures. They use deep learning, uh, which is Google's WaveNet, in order to synthesize response, uh, synthesize voice. And they use a really, really interesting blockchain-based machine learning algorithm to generate responses. But it's not AI. I'm, I'm really sorry to break that to you. I mean, a lot of people like to think of it as AI. 
they like to you know, talk about it as um, a yeah, kind of singularity net, but that's not true. Um, Sophia cannot understand general concepts. Sophia, can, if you were to tell Sophia something that she's never been told, it will not know how to respond to you. That is not a true AI. It is simply a machine learning based system. It, of course, granted, it's the most complex machine learning system out there, but it's nowhere near an AI. So, there might be people working towards that, but that's in a separate realm of technology altogether that we have not reached yet. But to answer your question uh, about 5-7% error, yes, I agree, that is a huge error for the field of healthcare. But that's precisely why people in the field of healthcare, oncologists, aren't going to be replaced. Because you see, in the majority of cases, uh, this deep learning technology can accelerate the work that an oncologist does. In 95% of the cases, it accelerates their work. There is a small 5% that, of course, it won't be able to accelerate. But the advantages heavily outweigh the disadvantages, especially if there's a human double, triple, triple checking all the work that the neural network does. Even if the human has, say, superhuman 1% error rate, or 0.5% error rate, and even if the neural network has a 5% error rate, there are error rates in different areas. The human might be better at diagnosing or biased towards diagnosing this, the neural network might not be biased towards diagnosing something else. The neural network, however, can be used as a kind of fact checker just to have another opinion on what on your diagnosis and just make sure that you know you're taking a look at all different points of views equally. So that's what the machine learning algorithm is meant for. It's not meant to replace the oncologist or to tell the oncologist what to do. It's meant to collaborate with the oncologist and have another set of eyes, computer eyes, looking at all of the data. Thank you. All right. Yeah, yes. uh, or, or. So hi, then again, Stephen Simon. Okay. Oh. So, uh, so we are in an educational institute. We are being always taught that learn a technology that will be in demand when we carry, when we graduate. Okay. So we have seen a phase where the cloud computing was coming. Yes. Then we are looking at the phase now. There's an AI and ML. What is something that you feel will be in demand in after say four to five years, or what is the next technology that will be taking to the market? Sure. So, first of all, let's take a look at machine learning for a second. So. There's a study conducted by Dr. Carter, uh, just a few days ago actually, they released this. Um, only 4% of companies that want to integrate machine learning have integrated machine learning. But they also surveyed a lot of different companies, and 72% of all companies say that machine learning is the most disruptive technology. 13% for cloud, and 7% for blockchain. So, as you can tell, I mean, a lot of people are really biased towards machine learning in terms of what the most disruptive technology is, and I completely agree with that. I would definitely say that machine learning is the most innovative technology that there is currently, and it's going to be the most in demand. In fact, currently, it currently it is in the most demand uh, of all technologies. And the reason I say that is because like cloud computing, it's great. Don't get me wrong, cloud computing is uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful technology, but banks are going to use mainframes. They're not going to switch to cloud yet. Yeah. Or blockchain, that's a great technology as well. But blockchain's not gonna help an artist create a painting or write a song, right? But machine learning technology, however, as long as you have data, and as long as you have the compute power to use that data, machine learning is applicable. It doesn't matter where it is. You could use uh, typing-based biometric authentication. It could be writing song lyrics. It could be creating a painting. It could be checking the weather. No matter what it is, you can use machine learning. And there are lots of different companies that have quite literally huge archive drawers full of data that they aren't making use of yet because they can't. But machine learning will let them do so. And especially when we start solving many more challenges that deep learning has, more and more people are going to start using it. So definitely machine learning is the number one. If I were to say long term, the most disruptive technology, quantum computing. Short term, it's machine learning. That close second would be IoT, blockchain, and cloud. So that's sort of the order that I think is the most important. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hi, Tanvi. I'm very happy to see you, first of all. Thank you. Um, if, uh, we all are very proud Thank to be you. an Indian. And I can see the entire uh, audience were, were pin drop silent. Everyone were admiring you. Thank Even you. they were inspired by you. Thank you. And uh, every mother needs kid like you. So. <laughs> I just would want to know how do you manage your time. I, sure. I don't uh, go in technically uh, because I am also mother of two kids and uh, I really uh, I want to take your uh, words and I want to hand it to you as So how do you manage your time? What is your routine? And what is the message you are going to give to these students? 
this tool. Basically. Sure. Thank you. Sure. No problem. So in terms of managing my time, so luckily this isn't something that I really have to struggle with just yet. And, and the reason I say that, I mean, I'm working on quite a few different projects, but they're all things that I just love doing. It's, it's not something that I need to take out time for. And like, you know, coming to this event, I was told, I think just a few days ago, that we have this event. It's not really something that was burdening me because this is the kind of stuff I love to do, right? It's just like whenever I have free time, I'll work on this project or another project that I have and kind of just the time slips itself up. Um, but, but what I will say is that occasionally, of course, I do need to prioritize some tasks over the others. Like, for example, I'm homeschooled. Um, and so whenever we are home, uh, the homeschooling is sort of usually the first thing that I do. Um, apart from that, there is, of course, all the projects that I'm working on, the YouTube videos that I usually record, the books that I'm offering, so quite a few different things. But because I love doing it all, it's something that just kind of happens. It's not like I need to take out time or arrange myself to do something. So that then is pretty interesting. Um, that's how I manage my time. Uh, sorry, what was your next question again? Yes, no, no assistance. So, Really, I think my sort of main message that I would give, really two things. So, first of all, make sure that you're doing something that you're really passionate about. If you're passionate about programming or engineering or whatever it may be, make sure you go ahead and do that. It might be art, it might be in the field of healthcare, no matter what it is, just make sure that you're doing something that you are personally very interested in. And the reason I say that, this especially applies to technology, but really applies to everything. Be perseverant. If you're not passionate about something, don't do it because you won't persevere. You need to make sure that every single time you, for example, stumble on a roadblock, you just understand that, well, you're facing a problem and you're never going to experience that problem or something similar ever again. So just having that sort of uh, idea in mind is really, really important. And also understanding that you shouldn't just learn from what you're being taught. Right? Don't, don't just learn from a spe specific curriculum. Don't just learn from a specific video course, whatever it may be. Learn on your own as well. Uh, learn by example. There should be the way for students themselves to actually learn by creating their own things, learning from their own mistakes, uh, which I think is really important in terms of example based learning. So, those are some of my main three tips, um, but really it depends on what you're passionate about and what you like to do. Thank you. Thank you. Any Hi, Tanman. Nowadays, through ML and uh, neural network, we can easily clone human voice. <laughs> yeah. Like you heard about Donald Trump, fake yeah. speech. Yeah. So when we are going to encounter such problem, how we are going to distinguish between the real voice and... <laughs> sure, sure. So this is, uh, this is actually a very, very interesting field. So a lot of people have been really scared of machine learning for a long time. Actually, just in the past few months. Because there have been a lot of things like machine learning being able to synthesize voice, machine learning being able to synthesize video, all that kind of stuff. But Really what you have to understand is that machine learning can do things, but machine learning can also detect what it is and what it does. So what I mean by that is if I were to record you right now, there's a specific pattern in human voice and a specific pattern in, in video. That means it's natural. However, if I were to record, say, 50 hours of you talking, if I were to be that to a neural network to synthesize your voice, you have to understand that the neural network is just a mathematical model. So what that means is that the neural network is essentially just taking the same map, synthesizing the audio from that same map. So what's happening is that there's a very subtle, but there is a very subtle distinct pattern that tells another neural network that, hey, this audio was generated by a neural network or it's real. So DARPA has actually already, sorry, uh, worked on an application that enables a neural network to predict whether a video is real or fake based off the person's face, or whether or not someone's voice is true or synthesized based off of the way it sounds. Now, to a human, the notice, the, the, the little patterns in fake versus real are unnoticeable. You cannot tell them, which is why it's so creepy, why it's so weird what this technology can do. But machine learning technology can easily detect what's real and what's fake. As a matter of fact, if you search up, um, I don't remember the researcher's name that worked on the project, but if you do uh, deep learning fake video detection, uh, it's going to give you a lot of results as to how you can actually detect fake video and fake audio through deep learning as well. So, a lot of people working on it. It's almost a solved problem. Not completely, but almost a solved problem. And technology currently is not nearly big enough to cause any large scale disruption. But even when it does, we'll be ready for it. Thank you. Thank you.
to ask you that what is the scope of ml in field of agriculture sure absolutely now agriculture is actually a really interesting field so um there's actually one really interesting application that i've been working on and i, I mean ibm has worked on an application in the past that actually enables them to track when exactly they water plants uh, and how exactly they water plants in order to determine the most efficient way to water them. And what that means is that in the end, by watering them more efficiently using machine learning, you should be able to get more yield and use less water at the same time, um, enabling you to be much more efficient with how many resources you're using. However, I'm also working on my own project. Uh, it's actually part of Project Cognitive on the sort of plants section of it. It's something that I'm going to be working on very, very soon. And essentially, uh, I'm not sure if you've seen this, but there's actually a documentary of plants having really, really simple nervous systems. Um, they don't actually feel pain, of course, not they're not intelligent in any way. But for example, if you were to attach a bunch of electrodes to a plant, and if you were to cut off the stem, you would see a spike in the electrical activity because it's actually able to kind of feel that, that cut. So uh, what happens, uh, what I'm currently working on, is not just tracking like UV rays or soil moisture in order to determine when you should water a plant, but, or the healthiness of a plant as well, but also being able to listen directly to the plant to determine how healthy it is or what it needs at the moment. Um, so it's a project that I'm working on. Uh, the possibilities in agriculture are huge. Um, there are lots of other technologies that are also applicable in agriculture, apart from machine learning, like blockchain, for example. Um, but again, the possibilities are huge on that. Thank you. First of all, hello. My name is Ayush. So now there's two questions for you. Uh, what is the views about general, uh, achieving general AI? And the second question is, uh, if we see a 2D drawing of something like a curve, we imagine what this cup and imagine uh, it is cup we can drink from it, like etc. Did it ever new network achieve this type of flexibility? So, no. Uh, neural networks will not reach complete flexibility and artificial general intelligence is not a possibility. Uh, and the reason I say that is because, let's just take a look at an example. So, what is a computer? It's essentially just a really precise and really fast calculator that can do a lot of operations at the exact same time. So, now what's interesting about that is let's just say you were to take the mathematical operations behind a neural network. And let's just say you were to write them all down onto a piece of paper, okay? This would be, say, hundreds of billions of mathematical operations. But let's just say you write them all down onto a piece of paper, okay? Then you take that neural net, those mathematical operations, and you do them one by one, every single one, in your head, no calculators. And then you do that hundreds of times. It would take you centuries, but you could theoretically do it. Now, if you were to do that, what would happen in the end is you would have created exactly what's on the computer, but on paper. Now, if you wouldn't count that as artificial general intelligence because it's just a bunch of math on paper, then why would you count what's in the computer as the you got? And there are lots of interesting reasons behind it, including your brain not receiving the computer as a computer, but I will get to that right now. Um, essentially, what happens uh, is you as human are just afraid of it because the computer didn't do this math in much faster ways than you can do So AGI, not a possibility whatsoever with the current computers that we have. Theoretically a possibility if we get kind of biotechnology, but not with AI. Uh, did you ever have an idea of programming a nanobot with a neural network? That is a very, very good idea. There are definitely initiatives towards doing that. Not sure if you've seen, but IBM has this thing called Five and Five, and they present at the Think Conference. Um, and basically, it's the five most disruptive technologies in the next five years. Uh, and one of them is actually a computer that is tinier than a tenth of a grain of salt, and it still has over a million transistors. Um, and so, essentially, you can put 64 of those computers that's a the size of a grain of salt. Um, you can definitely, theoretically, create nanobots that use machine learning technology using that. The possibilities, again, are huge in that area. Um, but I have not, unfortunately, been part of that yet, but I would love to get into it. Professor Dr. Pradeep Kumar, Pro Vice Chancellor Galgotia's University, to conclude the session. What a talk. It really is a bundle of knowledge and energy, continuously answering your all questions. And as a teacher, sometimes you say, it is not in your course, it is a question of next unit. But he has answered all your questions. Look at his age. 
14 years. And it simply violates our education system. When we say for second year, the prerequisite, the first year, unless and C class, don't think about Python. So now we have a parallel system coming up, where the sources are there, online systems are there, online learning sources are there. So not necessary. If you are a first year student of computer science or any branch, not to think about the courses like blockchain, artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc. So even in first year, you can learn Python, you can think about Hadoop, you can think about Scala. So these are the tools. So don't link these courses with your semester. This is the best message I think we should all get. Number of questions asked. One question was regarding the healthcare, and he is very right. The AI is based on basically the data collection. If we have more data precisely taken, then more precise, more accurate the system will be. Even if you are getting 6% percent, seven percent error in EHMR, it all based on your data. Increase the data, the system will work. So once again, on behalf of Elkote University and Elkote College of Technology. We are thankful to Tanmay and his family members for spending his time here and his valuable knowledge and inspiring young minds. Thank you very much. It's passion about his chosen area and it's the connect he has. I said, what else do you do in life? Do you have any girlfriends? He said, no. <laughs> you guys can give him a lesson in that. <laughs>